for this segment of What's Neat, we're going to cover a topic that I've seen in still print in the magazines over and over through the years, but I've never seen it done on video, and this is a very interesting process where video kind of makes it, it makes it very interesting to watch this process. And what I'm talking about is we're going to use a chemical etchant to etch our metal sheathing that we use for making our, our roofs, our corrugated roofs on a lot of our structures. And in the past, a safe way to weather this uh, medium of modeling material is to simply take dull coat and spray dull coat over this and then go over the edges with a little bit of uh, burnt umber oil paint and that would create my rust streaks and create a good effect of rust on these pieces. But today I'm going to do something a little different. This is an old technique that's been used for years and I, I can relate to using acids when I was in high school in the late 70s and early 80s, I worked at a hardware store and one of my jobs was to sit there and clean the concrete out in front of the building. And so one day I took uh, chemical etchant, in this case it was concrete etcher, uh, an acid that came in a gallon uh, container, and I sprinkled it all around on the wet sidewalk and I hosed off the sidewalks and everybody was pleased with the way it worked. It, cleaned off the top surface of the concrete through the acid process and it looked absolutely white and beautiful all over again got all the oil spots off it was nice except the next day when I woke up the tops of my tennis shoes had no tops they were literally the canvas shoes that I was wearing only had rubber soles left the entire tops were eaten away overnight by the splashback from that acid so when you're using acid you've got to use a great deal of respect with it today we're going to use a Etchant from Radio Shack. This is really cheap. You can buy a big bottle like this for about 11 bucks at Radio Shack and a bottle like that for doing what we're about to do literally could last you years. Now I've got everything set up here in the spray booth and I want to show you exactly the process of what we're about to do. The reason I'm using my spray booth is because I don't want to breathe the vapors that come off of this. It's very nasty stuff. You want to treat it with respect. So the first thing that I do is I take my sheets and I cut them up into smaller pieces. And this material sells at widths of two feet to four feet and everywhere in between. And so I'm cutting my sheets here right now at about three feet. And what I want to do is I want to place them in the chemical etchant. And I'm going to do this with you real time so you can see the process. I've poured the Radio Shack etchant into this bowl and I've got plain water in this bowl because water stops the process. So let me go ahead and show you how this works. I'm gonna go ahead and just put a piece of metal in this acid real time. And this is a fresh batch of acid, so this is gonna take about 30 seconds for it to start bubbling and getting hot. I'm gonna put in three pieces. I never put in more than three pieces because I don't want the process to get too carried away. If you leave this in, once the bubbling process starts, if you left it in there for 30 seconds, it would literally eat the metal to the point where you're gonna come up with nothing. So see, I've got it in the jar here. And I'm gonna turn on the spray booth because once it starts bubbling, it's gonna start giving off fumes. But I, wanna wa I want you to watch this action see it's starting to bubble. Now this material is going to get warm, it's going to get hot. There it goes. I'm going to hit the spray booth and I'm going to pull this out now and put it in the water to stop it. Just like that. And the other two are very quickly going on their own now. They're bubbling. Look at them go. I'm going to put this out and put it in the water, stop the process. And the third one I'm pulling it out. I don't want to leave it in there too long because it's already eating the sides off. Now they come out black. Everything comes out looking completely black. But the magic of this is, as you set this on a paper towel and you let this dry, after it's dried for about an hour or two, the pieces get this rust color on them in addition to the black. And you end up with absolutely beautifully weathered, rusted sheets of metal. If you look at this one right here, it's really been eroded away to the point where there's not much left of it. It looks weathered. It looks rusty weathered like it rotted away. And that's the process of using this chemical etchant. It's very quick. I suggest you wear rubber gloves. Do it outside if you can do it outside. But definitely leave yourself the ability to breathe because you don't want to breathe the gas that comes off of this during the acid etching eating process. 
If you get this stuff on your fingers, it's going to feel like you've got poison ivy for about a half an hour. Uh, it, you you want to pay great respect when you're using this material. Wear rubber gloves, wear a, a gas mask, do it outside. But the end result here, as you can see, this one's about to start to go and bubble and fizz, is that we're going to have beautifully weathered and etched pieces of metal for the roofing on our structures. And it's a very quick and easy process. Just a little dangerous. There it goes. Here, look at that starting to bubble. I'm pushing it down underneath. This one's going, this one's not going yet. And now both of them are cooking all by themselves in the acid. So I'm gonna pull them out now, drop them in the water. And if you look at this one, I missed it. It's too late. That one is completely deteriorated and gone. I did not get it out in time. And there's nothing left. There is absolutely nothing left of that piece of metal. So that's how the process works. If you look at this one that we just did, you can literally see through it. Uh, it's just a wonderful process. Treat it with respect, but this will enhance your roofs on your structure to a level that master modelers have been using this technique for years. So that's this tip for modeling for what's neat. Be safe out there with this one. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got Michael Buddy here again with some extraordinary automobiles from a company that I've never heard of out of the Netherlands, and I want to hand it over to Mike so that he can talk to us about these wonderful cars. All right, well these cars are a resin kit that come from the Netherlands, and they have a lot of European prototypes, but they have a lot of nice American cars too. And uh, the bodies are really nice, there's no preparation really needed. They, the resin finish is really smooth. They look like they're injection molded. But a guy named Peter Rings does the masters for these and uh, he does these all by hand and they're they're perfect as far as, as far as I can see. So uh, here's here's a 65 Plymouth, here's a 69, 69 Nova, 69 uh, Skylark. 69 Roadrunner and 69 Charger. I didn't realize they were all 1969s, except for this 67 GTX. Now, how do you order these? You go to the website uh, www.dutchartmodels.nl for Netherlands, and uh, they have a, a pretty wide selection. Scroll down on the left side to RPM 87. That's the, the brand of these models. And uh, what's the price point? Yeah, they're around around twenty dollars or a little bit less. The website is in uh, Dutch, and the prices are in euros, so it's hard to convert. I'm not really sure, but they're probably a little less than twenty dollars. These are pretty amazing, Mike. And you said these are yeah. resin castings, and you yeah. finish these all off with Scotch tape windows and. No, they come with with uh, window inserts. Oh, nice! And uh, I put those exhaust pipes on there and put the decals on there. But it, um, I did the bumpers with bare metal foil, and then they come with uh, plastic tubes so you can put your own wheels and ax axles in. They don't come with wheels, so you have to use wheels out of your scrap box or off of some cheaper cars or cast your own. That's what I ended up doing. Oh man, these are some really cool models, Mike. Thanks a lot for sharing this new manufacturer yeah. with us on What's Neat. All right, see you next time.
segment of What's Neat this week, we're going to deviate from the prototype and discuss something a little bit more colorful. There's a lot of money in the toy business, and today we're going to talk about something really cool that you could build. If you're a young man with some power tools that are cordless, or you're a well-established grandfather that's got a full-blown wood shop, you can work with these Brio trains and create a train set for your two or three-year-old that will add years of play value. I designed this set, actually took a top from an existing set that we got on Closeout. I think we picked this up from Sam's for about $30. And I built a bottom for it with wheels so that it could be rolled around so you could vacuum under it. And at the same time, I built a few drawers on it so that you could put your trains in it on one side. And on the other side, I put a drawer so that you could hold all of your track. These drawers are made with industrial type uh, drawer slides, the ones you get from the Home Depot, and they'll hold 150 pounds of weight. So in case your kids get all climbing on them and sitting on them, which I know that's going to happen, they're going to hold up without falling through. But just something simple, about three and a half foot square, you can make an octagon, a round top on it, you can buy a play set, anywhere you can find these type of Brio type trains and knockoffs from China, and set them up on top and just make a wonderful gift for your grandchildren or for your son or daughter that they'll enjoy for years to come. And it's one of those things that if you build it sort of nice and router the edges and make it smooth, it could become a family heirloom. So just something else to deviate again from the prototype. There's a lot of money in the toy train business, and this is quite popular among kids these days. So I just wanted to talk about this on this segment of What's Neat. For this what's neat modeling tip, I was having a discussion the other day with a friend and he was explaining to me how he stains his railroad ties when he's building bridges and has bridge ties or when he's handling his track and he pre-stains his ties. And it was explained to me how they take a coffee can and they'll fill it up with stain and then they'll take a strainer or one of those grocery store strainers and put it in a can and dip their ties like you're making french fries. And I gotta tell you, I came up with a method I've been using for years that's no fuss, no mess, and clean as can be. I'm going to stain 1,000 railroad ties right now in front of you with just a minute's worth of time. And what I do is I take my Minwax stain, I'm using a very dark color here, and I put in four little bitty, I'm using a, actually I'm using the top of one of my drill bits here to do this. I put four things of stain in here. Okay, that was five. I'm going to seal the bag and I'm simply going to mix them up in the bag. None of the stain will leak out. All of the ties will be thoroughly coated. And there's a thousand railroad ties in here. Can you imagine taking them all out and dipping them in your can individually? It would just take forever. Capillary action is what works here. The gravity is what works. Now I don't have a clock, I'm not timing this, but we've just stained a thousand railroad ties. And now all we have to do now is lay them out on a paper towel, set them out in the sun, and let them dry. And we'll be able to start hand laying track as soon as these dry off. Just toss the bag in the trash, and we've got perfectly stained ties, all four sides, ready to be spread out on this paper towel and simply laid out in the sun to dry. So that's a modeling tip on what's neat, just kind of a shortcut on how to stain ties and not really end up with a huge mess. For this last segment of January's show of what's neat, I want to set this clip up. Now I've just created a video on how to install the sound card decoder in this Blackstone reefer for soundtracks in November. And it's a really cool video that's got some neat tips in it. 
Now we talked about the mechanical reefer back in the December show, showing how the sound car decoder, if you add one, two, or three of them in the consist of your train, could replicate the actual train sounds of a train running in consist, and it sounds really cool. But for this show, I want to talk about another tip that's hidden in this video. The good folks at Soundtracks taught me a trick, and it's something that I need to do to all the brass locomotives that I need to add DCC and sound to, and that is to create power wipers for the tender, so that I can pick up on both sets of trucks and both rails in the tender all at one time. Now we've done this for years. I picked up this one locomotive from a good friend of mine, and his locomotive is done with wipers made out of just brass wire. And I've done that before and it works, but you really don't have tension. You don't get to have your constant tension because the brass wire is not sprung. But Soundtrax and Blackstone models showed me a trick using Katie Coupler springs. And that's also in this video of how you can make wipers for your sound cars, for your tank cars, and you can do this in HO scale and narrow gauge HON3, and it works beautifully on the models. So check it out. This is a really cool tip in this up clumbing clip in this new video that I just made. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you the easy process of installing a Soundtrax sound car decoder into this Blackstone HON3 reefer. I carefully disassembled the car by using a small screwdriver to pry off the bottom. I then unscrewed both sets of screws from each truck to remove them from the bottom of the car. I needed to fabricate contact wipers for the Blackstone trucks to power the decoder in the car. I reached into my scrap box of Katie Couplers and pulled out four Katie Coupler box springs from which we will make these power wipers. Using tweezers and my fingers, I bent out the coupler springs, creating what will be power feed wipers. I cut the spring box in half just beyond the punched hole, making four wipers, two for each truck. I test fit the wipers onto the top of the truck bolsters just to make sure everything would fit into position correctly with good wheel to wiper contact. I soldered very fine stranded wire to each of the wiper pads and I stuck them on masking tape during this process just to make the soldering a little bit easier. I used contact cement to glue the wipers on top of the truck bolsters. This glue is strong flexible and will stick to the Durlin plastic material that the trucks are made from. Here are some close-up photos of the finished truck wiper assemblies. Note I had good metal contact with all four wheels to the wipers on each truck. I followed the instructions that came with the sound car decoder and the current keeper and laid all of the components out including the 35 by 16 millimeter speaker that the sound car floor is designed to fit along with the speaker gasket and the shrink tubing. All of these items are available from Soundtrax. After installing both trucks back onto the freight car, I pulled the power feed wires through the holes just beyond the coupler pockets in the freight car's floor. This worked out really well. I soldered the wires from both trucks together, right side and left side, ready to be soldered to the decoder's feed wires. Using the laser cut speaker gasket, I pulled off the peel and stick sides and attached this to the uh, freight car's floor. Then I mounted the speaker to the self-adhesive gasket. I added shrink tubing to the sound car's decoder, red and black wire leads, before soldering the truck pickup wires. I soldered wire leads right side red and left side black as per the instructions. Then I pulled the shrink tubing over the exposed solder joint. I used the heat of the soldering iron to shrink the tubing tight around the joint. This process went fast. As you can see here, I am soldering on the black wire, the left side pickup wires, pulling the shrink wrap tubing over the solder joint and shrinking it with the soldering tip in close proximity without actually touching the plastic. I then soldered the two purple speaker wires from the decoder to each of the speaker solder pads. Turning my attention to the current keeper, I plug this into the connector on the end of the sound car decoder. 
This will keep the sound going even if I hit a spot on my track work where there is no power at all. I applied two-sided sticky tape to the decoder. Then I press fit this up into the shell of the car, sticking the, the, the uh, decoder up to the roof area. I then reassembled the cars floor to the shell, careful not pinching any of the wires while I was putting this together. And now I was ready to test run the sound car on the layout. So and now it's time to test our sound car decoder just to make sure that our installation and everything is correct. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to back up number 461 to the freight car to pick up the car. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to wave a magnet over the top of the sound car decoder so that it can consist and locate number 461. I push F8 on the throttle four times and now the car should be consisted and will run with the locomotive with sounds that match the speed of the locomotive as we go. Now we can further test that our current keeper is working by picking up the freight car and hear that the sounds are still playing in the freight car. Now I'm going to disconnect the freight car from the locomotive, from the consist. And in order to do that, what I want to do is wave a magnet over the top of the car. You hear the brakes engage. And when the locomotive pulls away, there will be no clickety-clack sound from the freight car. 